would like to invite now my colleague Andrew McDowell for our policy session. And Andrew will introduce the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Uh, my name is Andrew McDool. I'm a, also a partner at PwC Luxembourg in the strategy consulting side of the business. Um, not from Luxembourg, Irish by background, spent most of my career in the Irish public service, working on economic policy, industrial policy, and uh, was then nominated uh, by Ireland to join the management committee of the, uh, of the EIB in Luxembourg, which is what brought me and my family to Luxembourg. And I looked after energy financing during that uh, period of time for, for four years, and uh, including the revision of EIB's energy lending policies back in, in 2019, which uh, attempted to reposition EIB as the EU climate bank. Um, as has happened to many people in Luxembourg, when my term at EIB ended, uh, my family refused to leave. <laughs> and uh, that's when PwC very kindly took me in. And now I work with Daniela and others, mainly in the uh, topic of sustainable finance for, uh, for public institutions. Um, I've been asked to moderate today's uh, first session, which is really just the kind of context setting session for, for the rest of the day. Um, titled um, Implementing Repower EU Challenges and Opportunities, which is an opportunity, I think, for some, for some uh, excellent speakers to set the broader political, economic, environmental context in which the work of the Investors' Dialogue takes place. And uh, to, um, to take us through this session, we've got uh, five speakers, uh, five panelists, uh, the first, and I'm going to invite them to join, uh, to come to the, uh, to the podium one by one. The first is Matthew Baldwin, who's Deputy Director General of DG Enner. Um, Matthew is a, a graduate of Oxford uh, and has spent uh, over two decades in public life at the European institutions. Prior to serving as Deputy DG in DG Enner, he served in a, a similar role in DG Move. But he's also worked in uh, the cabinets of um, President Barroso, Commissioner Lamy, Commissioner Hill, uh, in that capacity as head of uh, cabinet. He is of Italian and British nationality and, uh, and speaks numerous languages and li lives in Brussels. So, so w welcome, uh, Matthew. Next to join us is uh, Morten Peterson. Morten, uh, please uh, take a seat. He, Morten is uh, vice chair of... Um, uh, of the Industry uh, Research and Energy Committee at the European Parliament. He's a member of the European Parliament, um, representing the Danish Social Liberty Party, and he's been an MEP since 2014, uh, Morten. And so in addition to your, your parliamentary work, I understand you're also president of Energy Solutions, which is a cross-political, cross-industry energy network in Brussels. So welcome and thank you for joining us, Morten. Next to join us is Roger Havanit, um, a good friend of mine from the European Investment Fund, and uh, we worked closely together when I was at EIB. Roger is Deputy Chief Executive of the European Investment Fund. In that capacity, he looks after <laughs> risk management, uh, compliance, financial control, so he's basically the guy who says yes or no to all the EIF operations. Um, but he also, in his capacity as deputy CEO, he looks after the relationship with the uh, European institutions, including of the EIB, but also the European Commission, uh, and in particular how EIF implements a lot of the mandates given to to it from the European uh, from the European Commission, including in InvestEU. Next to join us is Tim Gould, uh, who's a chief a chief energy economist at the International Energy Agency. Just discovered this morning that that. Tim and I are fellow alumni of uh, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. We were just a year apart in Bologna. Uh, but Tim is, uh, as chief economist, basically edits and manages the, uh, co-edits co the World Energy Outlook, uh, as well as the investment outlook. And Tim has be been at the IEA since 2008, initially as a specialist in Russian and Caspian Energy, so uh, no better person to guide us through the challenges of, uh, of the next year. 
Uh, and uh, he has also spent a significant amount of time, I discovered this morning, working in Ukraine. So, again, um, a very interesting experience in the current context. And last but not least, joining us is uh, Goran Bai, who's uh, Chief Executive of Norwegian Crystals. Uh, Goran has worked in the solar industry, in the solar manufacturing industry, for, for over 20 years in Europe, in Asia, in the United States, in the Middle East, but is now back in his home country of Norway, where he's running Norwegian Crystals and basically repositioning Nor Nor Norwegian Crystals as a zero, ultra-low carbon, uh, ultra carbon provider of, uh, of inputs into the solar sector. Um, and we look forward to hearing from, from Gorn about some of the industrial challenges and financing challenges facing innovators in the clean energy supply chain uh, in Europe uh, in the current context. Now, I'm going to take my seat. And the format that we've agreed to, um, to run today is to give every uh, panelist uh, from their seats, if that's OK, just to avoid as much um, uh, back and forth as possible from their seats, to give seven, eight minutes of reflections on the uh, opportunities and challenges in the implementation of Free Power EU. Um, following those interventions, I, I, may, I may supplement or ask for one or two supplements, uh, a couple of uh, follow-up questions. Um, we'll go through each of the panelists. We'll see how much time we then have for an open Q&A from, from, uh, from everybody here in the room. If there's time, we might get a little bit of dialogue going between you as well, and a little bit of interaction. And it would be great if the, the panelists picked up, if you can, on some of the points that have already been made. We would try and make this as interactive as possible. So we'll go in the same order that we, um, that we introduced you. Uh, so first, Matthew, uh, the floor is yours for, for, uh, for on, on challenges and opportunities in implementing Repower EU. Please. Thank you very much. Um, despite my voice, I'd like to assure you I don't have COVID. I think I've, I can assure all my panelists I'm, I'm negative. Um, and welcome to our extremely diverse uh, panel. Um, I note that we're somewhat wearing slightly different colored shirts. That's the diversity element. Um, but we did start with two female speakers, so that's, uh, it's downhill all the way from, from that starting point. Um, <laughs> you've heard the big picture already from Kadri Simpson. Um, I'd like to dig down just a bit into the blizzard of different policy initiatives that we pursued over the last 12 months, which actually coincide very well with the operation, the initial operation of the Investors Dialogue Initiative to enable you to pick a mix a little bit from that. And, and it all does flow from uh, Repower, Andrew. Repower we presented in May, as you know, it's the main framework for the EU's response to the energy crisis. Our goal is to make Europe independent from Russian fossil fuels well before 2030. By saving energy, by accelerating the rollout of renewables, by diversifying supplies, while supporting our international partners in this extraordinary crisis. You heard already from the Commissioner, Repower set some very ambitious new targets. 2030, we're now aiming to go from 40 to 45% for renewables, from energy efficiency from 9 to 13%, for the production and import of renewable hydrogen of 10 million tons, uh, respectively, as well, of course, as pushing forward on solar and wind power. And those proposals have not been sitting on a shelf, they've been actively taken forward by our partners in co-decision, and we very much hope for final decisions on the renewables target and the energy efficiency target in the first quarter of this year. Over the last course of this year, we then came forward with, as I mentioned earlier, a blizzard of different uh, policy initiatives, uh, including a number of temporary emergency measures um, to, to meet the repower uh, objectives. And the pace for a new boy who came in in June was remarkable. We had the gas storage regulation. Uh, to ensure that we have enough gas uh, in uh, our storages to withstand this winter and to prepare for next winter. We have overachieved the 85% target we set. We had the save gas for a save winter package to ensure 15% gas demand reduction across the board in the member states, with a plan attached to ensure that critical industry continue its work. We don't need to add an economic crisis to an energy crisis, although, although the two, I'm afraid, do go together. We had a regulation that enables member states to channel windfall profits of energy companies and to channel those to vulnerable 
um, businesses and to vulnerable consumers. We had an emergency regulation to enable us to aggregate our gas demand for volumes equivalent to 15% of member states' respective storage filling obligations. The view there is to move towards joint purchase as soon as possible to give us better leverage when buying gas on global markets. We also have provisions to further improve the solidarity mechanisms which we have in place in the case of gas supply shortages. We have a permitting regulation. Above and beyond what was already on the table, we are looking to accelerate the permitting granting process for renewable energy projects, particularly those with the highest potential for quick deployment the least and with the least impact on the environment. And last but not least, um, you will probably not have avoided noticing that we adopted a market correction mechanism in December to limit episodes of excessive gas prices that don't reflect world market prices, whilst ensuring security of supply and the stability of financial markets. And in an exciting but tiring finale to an exciting but tiring year, the Energy Council on the 19th of December saw agreement to the MCM as well as the joint purchase, the solidarity and the permitting mechanism. So we finished the year on a high point. It was a remarkable year for European energy policy making in line with and in some cases I would say directly enabling the big steps forward that we needed on supply diversification, reducing our, our reliance on Russian fossil fuels, um, an unprecedented high level of gas storage filling, as I mentioned, decreased gas demand across the EU. Um, we've also noted some very encouraging trends for renewables deployment. Early indications suggest a 44% increase in the deployment of solar across the EU in 2022. But, and you knew there was a but coming, didn't you? There can be no complacency. The challenges remain. As we enter 2023, we have to step up those efforts to reduce demand, to accelerate renewables deployment, and so on, uh, to prepare for the next winter, which promises, if anything, to be tougher than this. So if I may just, uh, in two more minutes, Andrew, just touch on some of the issues around investments and financing and the knowledge that we'll come back to this in discussion. These are essential key components to tackling the overall policy challenge. The revamped RRF uh, is the main EU support instrument in this respect. What we're trying to do is to use the EU's long-term budget, to use the recovery instruments under next-gen EU to support key policy priorities, the European Green Deal, the Repower EU objectives, clearly amongst them. As uh, you heard Kadri Simpson mention a moment ago, we estimate the additional investment needs for Repower EU to be around 210 billion euros by 2027. The provisional agreement, uh, again, I should have mentioned that my long list, uh, achieved between the co-legislators, again in December last year, on the amendment to the e -power, the Repower EU regulation, foresees the opportunity for member states to add a new Repower EU chapter to their recovery and resilience plans, which is the, the big post-COVID booster, to finance the key investments, to drive the key reforms to achieve our overall objectives. To finance Repower EU, member states can use 225 billion euros in loans available under the facility, and now an additional 20 billion euros of grants sourced from 60% from the Innovation Fund and from front-loading ETS allowances. There were a host of other EU funding sources, just to give a few examples for projects of common interest, the PCI, we've launched an 800 million euro call for clean energy infrastructure to support the Repower EU plan. The budget of the 1920, the 2022 Innovation Fund call for large-scale projects was doubled to 3 billion and includes additional topics, again, to support Repower EU goals. And last but not least, the Clean Energy Transition Life sub-program helps finance programs looking at crucial issues like buildings energy performance, uh, supporting public authorities in the clean energy transition, looking at whole issues around district heating and heat pumps, which go back to my former life, driving for climate neutral cities. All of these will be key for accelerating decarbonization. And as well as these targeted energy programs, there are large cross-cutting funds such as cohesion policy funds or Horizon Europe, which offer important funding opportunities. So in a nutshell, we are committed to spending at least 30% of the EU's long-term budget and next-gen EU, which is around two trillion euros on directly supporting climate and energy goals. And that uh, is, I think, a, a major down payment in what we're trying to do. Last but not least, we need 
private financing to back that up. All of this public money is great, but it's not nearly enough. Investment, as Kadri said a moment ago, is not a given in the current circumstances. If we're going to achieve this green transition and repower objectives, it's of utmost importance that we are successful in crowding in private financing, generating the multiplier effect, allowing for delivery of more investments on a shorter time frame. And that's what I hope we can discuss more in this panel today. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Um, if I could pick up just on, on, on one point very briefly, Matthew. I mean, as you say, you've, you've had a busy year. Uh, it's been a blizzard of announcements. I suppose if there's been one critique, if I may, um, it's that uh, while the announcements you know, have all uh, served the very important goal of improving Europe's um, security of energy supply, decarbonization in line with Europe's commitments, there hasn't been a lot of focus on industrial capacity to serve those ends, and in particular to build up the supply chains within Europe uh, in the way the United States has focused on through the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, would you say that's a fair criticism? Well, we're determined to do more. I mean, I think you've seen already, um, I mean, I'm not speaking here for DG Grow, who are working extremely hard in these areas. Um, part of what we need to do to, uh, to, to move forward is to make sure that we don't, through this energy crisis, damage our industry capacity. And that's why we came with the Demand Reduction Management Plan, which sets out precisely how we think in the Commission member states to look at doing a sort of triage, which industries are desperately dependent on gas, fertilizers, chemicals, and so on, and, and where, can, where can we maximize the use of energy inputs. Um, the IRA is, well, I mean, we, how much time do we have? Huh? It, it's, it's challenging in many ways. I should, I'm told we should call it the era for various reasons. <laughs> Um, the era, uh, the, invest, the, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US is challenging uh, in a number of different ways. Um, I, I am also pleased to see it's not a fixed menu. Um, the Americans have now allowed within uh, the, the EV provisions, electric vehicle provisions have now been opened to under European pressure to more. But what it has done, I think, is stimulate an interesting conversation between European leaders and, of course, the Commission as to how we can indeed push further ahead uh, to, to, f to provide a response um, uh, uh, in our industry. When we look at the, the different issues around generating renewables, we do have supply chain issues, and I think that's, that's clear, um, and I think we need to address those in a, in a frank and a fair way, and we are doing so. Thank you very much. Morton, the European Parliament, rock solid behind the agenda that's just been laid out. Thanks so much, and, uh, and, and thanks for uh, inviting me today, uh, Andrew, and let me just offer a couple of uh, reflections and perspectives from, uh, from Parliament's uh, point of view, and, and uh, obviously uh, Matthew uh, laid out uh, all, all these, this context, and, and I think it's extremely important uh, in the midst of this crisis also to, to take a step back and bear in mind uh, what it is that, that uh, that, that we're trying to do at the outset of this uh, mandate with the Green Deal and the Fit for 55 uh, package. Um, now, uh, which is really a, a tsunami of, of legislation. Uh, I believe it's like 3,800 pages uh, in all. It's, it's the biggest uh, project in the history of the European Union uh, to, uh, to adopt. Uh, so, uh, we'll be extremely busy over the remaining part of this mandate, the next, uh, the upcoming 12, 14 months or so, uh, getting this through, uh, trying to, to adopt this. And let me just offer a couple of, of reflections on, 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 on some of this. So, um, th this is really a, a, a gigantic exercise. And, and, and uh, what we do in European Parliament is obviously we, we uh, try to legislate together with member states and, and, and the Commission. Uh, would be a, 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 an honest broker, at least a broker, but but uh, hopefully also honest. Uh, and and we we end up in in what is called trilogues, where we uh, you put 60, 70 people in a room with no windows, and we negotiate until four o'clock in the morning. And if there ever was an original idea entering the room, we we make sure that we take it out uh, when when leaving the room at four o'clock in the morning. This is what we'll be doing over the next 12, 14 months or so. Uh, basically living in, in, in these buildings and, and rooms trying to get this through, which is extremely difficult and, and interesting and, and dramatic as well. Now, uh, then comes along the terrible 
uh, war in, in, in Ukraine, uh, which essentially is a wake-up call for, uh, for all of us. Uh, adding energy independency and security uh, considerations to this uh, enormous agenda that, that we already uh, had. Now, uh, the fundamental problem and, and paradox and, and, and uh, I'd say perversity is that we're basically sponsoring Putin's war in, in Ukraine. So this is a break and has to be a break with an entire model, so to speak, that we've built the European economy on over the last decades. Uh, just to illustrate how, how, how dramatic this is, and, and it is making an impact. Uh, I, I come from uh, Denmark, a small, uh, peaceful country, and we've clearly underestimated the seriousness of this, the gravity of, of this. And the impact is starting to be felt all across uh, Europe, and it just adds further to the sense of urgency in, in, in all this. Now, uh, I think all, all the uh, relevant and good points were, 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 were made here. Um, it is a wake-up call. Uh, we, we, we have a lot of work to do on, on renewables. Uh, same applies to energy efficiency. I mean, who, who would have thought uh, a year ago that, that issues like energy efficiency and buildings would become security politics uh, of, of first degree? I mean, something as nerdy and technical and politically unsexy as energy efficiency or buildings directive is now uh, security politics because... Obviously, what is it that we can do in the very near term? I mean, that is to isolate and renovate and, and, and what have you. Whereas, and I'll get back to the permitting issue, by, by focusing on generation, we all know that previously it would take like six, eight, ten years, whatever, uh, to have an offshore uh, installation up and running. But let me get back to, to this. Now, in all this, implementation is going to be uh, tricky and difficult. Uh, there'll, there'll be, especially uh, within the energy efficiency related measures, we know that that member states are, uh, I'd say, somewhat reluctant to to uh, to, to implement. And we face this internal uh, dilemma that that uh, politicians get to be rewarded nationally or punished nationally, also by the stuff that we would end up doing in Brussels, uh, which is why we have serious disagreements. Uh, uh, not only within European Parliament, but, but clearly also among member states on some of these absolutely critical issues. So this is a political context that we have to navigate within over the next 12, uh, 14 uh, months. Um, uh, so need for speed, speeds of essence, sense of urgency are, are absolutely uh, keywords in this. And in this context, uh, there's a lot of, of good things to be said on, on the repower. EU. I'm, I'm totally disregarding the fact that Parliament is not involved as a co-legislator uh, on, on, uh, on Article 122 measures. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get back into to, to do this, but speed is of essence. And, and, and let me say specifically on permitting. Uh, I, I was a Parliament's uh, spokesman on, on, on the offshore uh, strategy. And at that point in time, uh, time limits on permitting specifically was dead in the water. Uh, that was prior to Ukraine. Uh, so on, on an extremely sad background, things are moving now on, on permitting, which it ought to be and needs to be in order to uh, bring up speed in, in, in this. Uh, a case in point, uh, the, the, the Danish concept for an energy island in, in, in that version is, is due to be operational in 2033. And, and it, it, it's a leading time of 12 years or so, which is just uh, too long a time span if, if we are to, if we would ever dream of fulfilling our 2030 uh, ambitions, obviously, and adding to this if we want to increase uh, independency from uh, imports from, uh, from, from Russia. So we, we basically have to uh, increase speed in this. Therefore, uh, this concept of time limits uh, and and, and, and speeding on permitting is absolutely key. Luckily, this is what we're able to do now and, and hopefully also on a more uh, permanent uh, basis. Now, uh, opportunities, uh, we need to look into uh, hybrid projects facilitating that that uh, this is also doable in, 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 in the offshore uh, scene. Uh, we have to, and, and, and I think uh, adding to, to, to what uh, Matthew was, was alluding to, this entire discussion on the industrial perspectives in, in our clean tech sector is, is gaining more prominence and should have. Because when talking to stakeholders or pension funds or investors uh, out there, there is a real worry. We see things flagging out of Europe uh, these uh, months uh, and, and years due to, you, you said ERA, not IRA, or, 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 or was it? IRA. 
All right. Okay. Sure. Uh, so I think it is not to be underestimated the gravity of this in terms of job creation and and and, and industrial policy. So the entire. Uh, field of, of clean tech industrial policy uh, should have a renaissance, will have so, because uh, we are in, in Europe at large quite good in, in many areas, but we're losing out to uh, to, to, to other countries, uh, not least uh, the, the Chinese. Gordon, no. we're running just yeah. out of time, so maybe Sorry. a seconds here. Finally, let, let, me, let me, me wrap it up, because uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion as well. Just one word, if you allow me, Andrew, on, on what's coming up in the first quarter on the electricity market design issues, uh, because uh, I think it's, it's really an important discussion to have. What is it that we eventually want to do? Because uh, the current model has served us well in many ways, integrating renewables, not to the speed that uh, a lot of us would uh, like to see, but let's make sure that we do not throw the baby out with uh, the dirty bathwater in, 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 in this. I'm worried uh, when talking to investors that, that want to have stability and predictability that we should not have a future regime where we will have to legislate uh, like every second year or so on some of these extremely sensitive issues because uh, what we end up then having is investors uh, running away from uh, what they ought to be doing, uh, investing in, in, in renewables and this deployment. Sorry for, for, for taking too long time. It's a pleasure being here. Looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Morton. Um, obviously, a lot of um, announcements, a lot of commitments, a lot of targets, but they all have to be financed um, at the end of the day uh, by, by some type of mix between public and private sector. And the role of the EIF, Roger, is obviously to help address a lot of market gaps in the financing of policy of EU policy objectives. Is there a big market gap in the availability of capital and financing for, for climate and uh, clean energy infrastructure? Should work now, okay. It's not a simple answer, yes. The answer is yes, but um, let's um, pick up some of the Statements I've heard before. First, um, we need to crowd in private. I think um, I agree with you that no matter what is the size of public uh, amount available, and there are certainly sources available, invest the Uri power, and I'll come to it, uh, it is largely insufficient if you don't manage to get private investors on board, and they don't come for free, of course. They want to come because there's a value uh, proposition, because they see that uh, this works and it's done in a smart way. And I think that's the point where the public policy goals, which are certainly our drivers, meet the market, the market requirements. How do you align private investors, institutional investors, uh, on the need to invest in these areas? Uh, certainly, you need to have clarity in the policy. You have cl clear signals, but you need also to set up schemes in a way that they make sense for all the participants that they are prepared to chip in their part of the money, that they um, uh, consider that the policy and the financial um, go together. Now, that's what we are trying to do together with our partners, uh, EIB, but the uh, European Commission very much, who are also, by the way, our shareholders. And um, there are, to, to answer your question, a number of sources of funding available. From the public side, uh, certainly from the IB, we had resources in the private equity venture capital field, very important for innovation. Also from uh, EU programs, before it was FC, now it's InvestEU, which has started. Uh, resources that we use both in the area of guarantees, and very often, let's not forget, it's not only about the, the most innovative companies, there are hundreds of thousands of companies who need to green also, who need to do such unsexy things as energy efficiency, and we have done programs such as um, uh, these ones, including in countries like, like Malta, where there is a lot of sunshine, but still a need to, to, to work on energy efficiency. Um, and uh, we do a lot also in the area of uh, private equity. We don't do it ourselves. We don't have the expertise in-house to look at the hundreds of thousands of companies. We do it through funds. We have hundreds of funds, and many of them are in the area of sustainable finance. Some are in other areas, life science, uh, other areas of technology. But more and more, we see dedicated funds um, who really have the expertise in particular fields. 
and we invest in these funds and they look for the best companies. And this can be very broad. It can be from intelligent um, battery storage uh, over the cooling of data centers uh, to, to uh, charging stations and so on. So there's a lot of innovation in that field. That's traditionally what we have done uh, at the tune of around three and a half billion a year. And we are likely to step it up also thanks to um, resources such as Repower you, where the EIB group is part of the EU family and will make available a package of 30 billion. Now, the amounts themselves don't mean a lot unless you understand uh, what is the multiplier, how you can share the risk, how you can co-invest, how you can attract private resources. And let me say, because you, you, you were making a statement about the needs, which I fully agree with, is hundreds of billions just to become uh, less dependent on Russia and on fossil fuels. So I heard the figure of 300 billion. Um, the package that we are aiming at should mobilize 100 billion, of which 45 the EIF will try to mobilize so in various areas for equity. But it's again not only public, it's blending private and public resources. Now, is that enough? Certainly not. Uh, we also do activity in the area of infrastructure. Uh, and if I talk about infrastructure, I mean by this uh, very broadly um, energy. Uh, I mean also um, the, the social um, infrastructure that we need, uh, the digital infrastructure and um, energy efficiency for sure, but also circular economy, so very broad. Uh, it's an area which requires specific expertise and let me say also that um, it's important that we don't only pump money there, but we also bring expertise and best practices, because that is also comfort to the investors. Very often they want to attract the private, they want to have a seal of approval, they want to be sure that there is a very strong due diligence being done, there's environmental impact assessment, that we are parasaligned, that we do not significant harm, and we have um, worked together with our colleagues in the mother, the EIB, who have particular expertise to look at uh, environmental impact, ESG, uh, and we decline it down very much. So for us, it's uh, quintessential not only to throw the money, but to make sure that it's going the right, for the right purpose and it's accompanied also with this um, support. Now, uh, let me also say, uh, because I heard some, some comments before, uh, not everything is perfect, and there are a number of things on my wish list um, for sure. Not only getting more money uh, for sure, but um, certainly also to have a holistic approach. Certainly some is in the regulation, but uh, it's also capacity building, and some is also in what is sometimes called red tape. You refer to it more than before. The permits, uh, the time it takes, it's certainly important. But also, I'm, I'm not so much in, in favor of controls. I'm in favor of good incentive schemes to get it right, basically. And the public sector and the member states can do more, in my view, in this, these areas. Um, first of all, there's a question of risk appetite. Are we prepared, um, as public sector representatives, to, put, um, to take on higher risk, to put the money into early stage risky projects, maybe? Uh, also in less proven technologies, um, talking a lot about hydrogen, talking a lot ab about biogas and so on, but uh, are we prepared to invest in first-time teams, not only the proven ones, and, and also unproven technologies or less established uh, technologies? Are we prepared also um, to, to invest uh, in unsexy projects, as we said, like energy efficiency. Yeah, exactly. We, we have to make the incentives for it. Uh, and industrial decarbonization. So um, I'll, I'll maybe stop here, but uh, in my view, there are many opportunities, but we can only succeed if we bring the public and the private sector together, and if we look at it in a holistic way. Finance is important, but we need also technical assistance, we need to have the mindset, and we need to mobilize in a smart way the financial instrument. Uh, just to pick up on one point, Roger, if I might, and very briefly, because yeah. we need to move on. Um, are, are, is EIB or EIF turning down projects, either for lack of financial resources or because they don't fit the right instruments. There's a gap in terms of the instruments. And I ask you this because you've always been a big proponent of a kind of strategic industrial policy instrument, which, which isn't available. And I remember this from EIB. At EIB, industrial policy was a dirty word. 
um, you know, everything had to be WTO compliant, multi, it was, you know, a creature of the 1990s in some ways. And the world has moved on. And as the world has moved on to become a little bit more geopolitical, Commission is, 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 <laughs> has embraced um, uh, its geopolitical role. Um, but in terms of the financing instruments, there is no instrument that specifically supports kind of industrial strategic autonomy within Europe. Is, is that something that, that causes you problems? Do you see projects you'd like to support but can't as a result of that? The answer again is yes, unfortunately. Um, it is not dramatic at this moment in that um, we had new resources, but let, let's be clear. I mean, we have a sustainability guarantee, so this is less in the equity field, but for mainstream SMEs, it's totally oversubscribed, and what we have to do is to ration. We are in, in year one out of seven. It's already committed. Okay? So we will have to turn down in the future projects, not now. But uh, clearly, um, it shows the success. It, it shows the need. Now, let me say a word about industrial policy and, and maybe um, industry also of the future and, and the future of, of Europe. Uh, we, are, we are very much concerned about um, a situation where we have wonderful universities, great innovation potential, support schemes like EIC, grant schemes, early stage support, start up, but uh, not enough to follow through in the growth period when the tickets are bigger. Now, some of it is being addressed by, by a number of member states, Germany, France, Spain, and so on, through scale-up initiatives, but let's be clear also that for the, the technologies of the future, the critical ones, we'll probably need something that uh, Commissioner Breton has announced, like a, sovereign, uh, uh, a EU sovereign fund. I mean, to have the, the, the means to attract, with public money and risk-taking, private, to multiply, and to have considerable means, the critical uh, mass, to invest and to follow through also in the next funding rounds. Failing which, I'm afraid we will see some of what is happening now, and which is, uh, by the way, you, you were referring to the Inflation Reduction Act being promoted, that some of the best industries here find attractiveness in accepting finance from the US or China or other areas. And state aid is certainly important to look at, but we need to have the critical mass, and it's not yet there. So. I've no doubt we'll come back to that with Gordon as well because it, there's a real danger, it seems to me, that we, we innovate a lot, a lot in Europe uh, in this space and, and then it's all commercialized in the United States. Tim, um, in that context, obviously our focus today is mainly on Europe in terms of the opportunities and challenges, but you're looking at the world and you're looking at Europe's challenges in the context of, of what's going on in the rest of the world. Give us a sense, is, is it similar? Are, are the things we're talking about here today, the challenges and opportunities facing Europe, the same things they're talking about in Asia and the United States? Well, I think there's, a, there's an acute nature to the challenges in Europe because of the fall in Russian deliveries of gas, um, which you don't see elsewhere. Um, so I guess, you know, what happens here has repercussions, has echoes, um, but I don't think you have quite the same intensity of the debate um, that, you, that, you have, uh, that you have in Europe. But I would like to pick up on, on, on this, this last discussion because um, there's a lot of focus now also within IEA on thinking through what industrial strategies look like, what the implications are. As has been said already, the Inflation Reduction Act is a, is a big challenge. Um, and, and China's not sleeping on this as well. I mean, China's been very active in this area for, 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 for a long time. And anyone who looks at the solar PV value chain will see that. They have, Chinese manufacturers have an 80% share of all aspects of the solar PV chain, and that will not change quickly. If you look at the projects in the pipeline, um, at least through the end of this decade, um, the percentage of China's share in a lot of these value chains is at least as likely to go up as it is to go down. Um, so I think there is a, you know, room for a, for, a, for a very serious debate in Europe and elsewhere about the, how, to, how to respond. That said, we did some work which we released this morning, which was jointly with the European Patent Office, looking at patenting activity in hydrogen technologies. And there's a few things that I think are noteworthy in this respect. First, that there's been a significant shift over the last 10 years from sort of more traditional fossil fuel-based applications towards the clean energy uh, applications of, of, of hydrogen, as, as you might imagine. And I think it's also encouraging from a European perspective that when you look at 
who's doing the patenting in different parts of the world. I mean, Europe is actually coming out on top. So um, many of the leaders in this space are in Europe. And in, in some ways, there's a good match between the sort of patenting activity that's taking place and some of the investments that you're seeing, particularly in electrolyzer manufacturing. Um, but we, we very much recognize the, the, nature, the, 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 the risk that's inherent in the conversation that we've just been having um, that, as happened in the past with some clean tech, um, Europe will be the innovator, but the large-scale manufacturing and much of the additional value will be captured elsewhere. Uh, and I think that's an extremely important area for, for, for policy to, to be looking at and also for, um, to make sure that we have adequate financing instruments to, to, to support that activity um, in Europe. I think the other area where we need to be very watchful is on what uh, Matthew was saying about this risk of complacency. And because I think, you know, we started the year with TTF in the sort of low 20s, so that's roughly half the average from 2022. Um, we've got very encouraging numbers for gas storage. Um, but please, let's not imagine that Europe is, is out of the woods here. Um, because it wouldn't take much in terms of temperature or in terms of a further reduction in Russian gas deliveries or in terms of uh, you know, a resurgence in Chinese LNG imports um, for market tightness to come back quite quickly. Um, and that would bring with it all of the concerns that you know, we're very used to, and, and the particular concern that, that it will be European industry that is the sort of balancing item, and particular, not in a positive way, but in, in terms of, of demand destruction. And so some work that we did and was launched jointly by our executive director and, and uh, the commission president, uh, Van der Leyen, at the end of last year was trying to underline that you know, there, are, there are different ways that this plays out, and it's exceptionally important that policy gets in the lead uh, and that we have more structural resolution to the tightness in markets through things like the instruments that we've talked about today, rather than the sort of more, um, how can I say, undesirable ways to balance markets via pressure on industry or indeed through, uh, through increased coal burn. Thank you, Tim. Um, by the way, I loved... Uh uh, your remark in, in the last uh, World Energy Outlook that um, we passed, the, the golden area, era of gas has already passed and we're having a, obviously something of a debate in Europe about whether there's still a need to invest in gas infrastructure. Um, any views on, on the scale of investment required in gas infrastructure in Europe uh, in light of the shutdown or the likely you know, permanent shutdown in, in, in uh, supplies? Russia? So in our view, I mean, that rupture in the EU-Russia gas relationship is permanent. Um, and so you will need to reconfigure some gas flows across Europe um, because, as everyone is aware, that system has been built to move gas from east to west and you're going to have to have some, 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 uh, some new flows involved. Um, that said, it's very tricky, as, we've, as, as we can all see today, um, to talk to a long-term industry like the gas industry about the resolution of sort of five to 10 year, old, 10, 10 year horizon uh, problems. And so um, it is, you know, that temporal mismatch is cropping up in discussions on infrastructure, it's cropping up in discussions on, um, on new gas supply contracts. Um, and I think we need to be uh, more creative in thinking about how we structure some of those arrangements so that they are available when we need them this decade um, but don't prove to be an obstacle to our longer-term decarbonisation objectives as we move into the 2030s and beyond. Thank you. Gorn, I'd like to turn to you now uh, to hear, obviously, a little bit more about Norwegian crystals, but also to pick up on this, on this discussion about, um, you know, uh, Europe may be a very good place to innovate, but is, is it going to be a good place to, to commercialise? And particularly in the context of the Inflation Reduction Act. And are, are you feeling any pressures from your investors, your stakeholders? Look west, young man, as they used to say in the, <laughs> in the, in the, in the 19th century. Yeah, except to say look west, old man. But besides <laughs> that, it's, it's uh, true. Yes, Norwegian Crystals is uh, operating in the solar value chain where we make monocrystalline silicon, which uh, 
serves as the substrates of solar cells. There are the name. Uh, we've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, we've had all the scars. We have all the ups and downs of this industry. Uh, and we are currently at the latter stages of raising equity for a 12-time expansion in northern Norway. So we are living this uh, area that we talk about here now. And we are trying to do our best to provide some alternatives for Russian fossil fuels into Europe. Um, so, one thing that is talked about, but which I feel is not really understood, is the scale that we need to develop and expand these value chains, and in a very short term. So, in the European Solar uh, Industry Alliance that we launched about a month ago, uh, we have set a target of 30 gigawatts of solar manufacturing across the value chain. What does that mean? It means that most of the value chain will have to grow from about 2 to 30 gigawatts in 2 to 3 years. That is a Herculean effort in order to get there. So we have to get to scale and we need to get there in, uh, with a very, uh, well, let's call it Chinese speed, because that's what we need to do. Uh, and you don't do that with innovative products that don't become commercial for seven to ten years. You have to build that platform with the best available technology we have today. And then when we have built that industrial platform up to a certain size, whatever that could be, maybe it is 30 gigawatts, then there's a home for innovations in the future. They don't have to go to China, they don't have to go to the US. So how can we get that, that speed up to scale? So we know firsthand that there are private investors out there that want to invest into European PV uh, production, at least into non-Chinese uh, PV production. Uh, and uh, we have been able to attract uh, a lot of good investors, but they are not really willing to stick their neck out uh, unless there is some sort of public risk mitigation or investment offloading that can be, be had in this. That is necessary in order to, to get through that bubble. Um, so, uh, from our perspective, uh, we think that uh, Repower Europe should try to uh, mobilize the existing instruments. Uh, you know better than I who they are, but existing instruments that can be repurposed and maybe modified a bit in order to support this, this uh, uh, rapid development of the value chain. Uh, new instruments will be too slow. I understand that 12 to 14 months might be very quick time period <laughs> in politics. It isn't when you try to do something in the field. You need to have it now. And we have already spent 12 to 14 months just getting to this stage here. So that is important. Um, I know that the state aid is a very sore point, uh, but by relaxing the, the state aid guidelines a bit, uh, and uh, not at least when it comes to this about innovation, uh, uh, and, and actually let this be a support of, of scale-driven projects, getting up to that scale. That would be very helpful in the long run for the, uh, the uh, EU, particularly in light of IRA, because IRA is a little bit more uh, complex and involved than it looks like uh, at, at, uh, at uh, the surface. But reality is that uh, for solar PV, the support offered by American authorities as tax credit is uh, about 50, 50% of the cost of a solar panel. And if you take the silicon out of it and just look at the work that goes into taking that silicon up to a panel, it covers 100%. And you know, it's very, very difficult for a little company in Northern Norway to compete with for free. So this is a very, very strong signal. And we can think what we want about it, but it's creating noise and it's attracting, of course, the private capital. Uh, and I think this is the challenge we have with seeing that innovations in Europe either go to die or they go to different geographical uh, locations in order to be uh, developed and implemented. So I think just finding a way to build these value chains to a critical mass in Europe, that is the innovative point that we should focus on. And then the longer term will be the technology uh, in, uh, innovations uh, that will keep us competitive in the long run. It's a, it's a really 
I mean, it's a fascinating uh, challenge when you think about the kind of the role that state aid has played in in the construction of the European single market over decades. It's been an absolutely vital component of political trust in the single market, of confidence in the single market, that all the member states apply the same restrictions on industrial policy. But it was built up in a context of multilateralism, where there was a com growing commitment, uh, including an expectation that China would in time subject itself to the same type of rules. The United States was a WTO obviously member. So our main competitors were all moving in the same direction. And now we're in a situation where there seems to be a breakdown in that consensus around the role of state aid. And Europe still, obviously, for to maintain the role of the, the single market, is still committed, obviously, and has to be committed to the, uh, implement state aid rules, while the rest of the world has just kind of moved on. And, and I, I think the, I, I have a sense this is going to be an ongoing political challenge within Europe for years to come. How do we combine... Um, member state trust in the, in, the, in the fairness of the single market, while the rest of the world is investing massively in industrial policy. Um, I, I, at this point, and, and please, uh, you know, we, we'll have an opportunity to, 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 to bounce off each other a little bit more over the uh, course of the Q&A, but I do want to open it up to the audience. And I think we've got microphones uh, that, are, that are available, yes, uh, at the back of the room. So, could, it, it, would anybody at this point like to, to pick up on any of the, uh, the points that have been raised? I see a lady's already raised her hand. If you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and a gentleman here. Uh, so we have two requested interventions. If you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and, uh, and please, a, 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 a brief comment if you wish, but a question to the, to the panel. Sure. Uh, good morning. My uh, name is Joana Freitas. I'm a representative of Euroelectric in the Investment Investors Forum, and thank you so much for your um, uh, interventions today. So my question is about urgency, and um, I wanted to ask um, perhaps uh, Matthew Baldwin, what are we lacking so that we have um, a bias for urgent action in terms of not only our legislators, but also our citizens? Um, we have seen in 2022 that with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Commission pledged to move away from fossil fuels from Russia by 2027. And here we are in uh, January 23, and I believe it is largely done. Uh, the oil embargo on Russian imports has taken care of the oil side of things. Russia has, in, in turn, disconnected itself from the gas pipeline to Central Europe. Um, and so Europe was able to very quickly mobilize for a very important change in its energy uh, sources. Uh, when sovereignty and defense was, were at risk. I don't think we've managed collectively to do that for climate change. So my question is, what can be that trigger for urgent action and not just you know, 2030 or 2050 targets? Thank you very much. Thanks, Joanna. Le and let's take another, just, uh, we'll group a few questions. Um, so I see there was a gentleman in the second row here. Good morning, everybody. Pierre-Marie Dobreuil from Sphil uh, French Public Bank. Uh, thank you very much to all participants. And uh, I will make a, a link with uh, the last speaker who spoke from uh, industrial sovereignty. In fact, it is very important not to be dependent, not on fossil fuel, but on technologies or know-how that are outside Europe. And uh, when it comes to, and I will draw a parallel with uh, the export business. If you do export out of uh, Europe, outside the world, then it is possible without uh, hurting the state aid rule to provide public guarantee at 95%. It is, would be forbidden it is, if it is a, a, a European factory for the European market. So is there here very quick decisions that can be uh, made in order to, uh, I would say, uh, incentive uh, public guarantee at higher rates than what is uh, allowed according to the common treaty, the European uh, treaty. And uh, my uh, second uh, uh, question is, and this kind of blended finance via uh, credit insurance is something that is so far not that developed 
uh, in the European uh, area. It is they are first lost or uh, direct lending, but uh, credit insurance is not that developed. Could that be an idea for the future? If there's no further questions at this point, I'll pass them back to uh, to the audience. I mean, I, th I think. Um, Matthew, you were you were the target of the first question. We we've we've moved at speed in response to the Russian crisis. But why didn't we, why aren't we moving at the same speed in response to the climate crisis? Or are we? Well, I think we are. Um, and thanks for the question. I mean, I'd like to pick up some of the points made in the panel because I know time is limited. So I'll just try to speak once. And I think the three three key words I want to pick up: urgency, complacency, and optimism. And I'll, I'll try and pick up uh, in relation to three points there. So on this point about urgency, yes, we have moved fast. Just as an illustration of how quickly we got out of Russian gas, I think we've come down from, um, I don't have the exact numbers with me, 45% uh, um, of our gas coming through uh, Russian pipelines, now just 7%. Still quite a lot of Russian LNG coming in. But that is a seismic change, and it's a change which is you know, not easy to absorb at great speed for a number of our member states, particularly the small landlocked countries. So it's, it's been a Herculean effort to keep everyone uh, in, this, in the same place and in, in moving in the good direction. And I, I'm very proud of that, and we're very pleased with it. Now, w your question is, why can't we go in that direction also on climate change? I think this crisis is part of that urgency and it has indeed triggered it. The world has changed. I don't want to say in a sort of end of history sense forever, uh, on the 24th of February, 2022. It has changed in irrevocable ways, I think, as Tim was saying, in terms of there is no going back to our critical state of dependency on, on Russian gas. Um, and it has triggered, I think, a fast escalation. I referred to it in my, my remarks in terms of the take-up um, in, 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 re in renewables, oh, even just in the course of 2022. It is a wake-up call. Any well-designed energy policy needs to, it needs to address sustainability, yes, security of supply, yes, and affordability. And I think we've underinvested in security of supply. And the beauty is that security and sustainability go so well together. If you, you, know, if you can generate more of your energy products within the EU, you're on, you're on to a winner, by definition. So I'm very confident that that will happen, and it's vital that this discussion drives it and that there are these um, investment opportunities. Um, just to pick up what Tim said on complacency, I completely agree. People are saying, I'm hearing on the radio now, everything's going to be fine, we're going to get out of this, it's going to be good this winter, the there's going to be no more frost this winter. Throw away your overcoats and stride forward with confidence. Please, let's keep up the efforts. We will continue to do so in the EU. Member states need to do that, and, and, and citizens need to do that, without being what I call the long, wagging commission, nagging finger. Um, but also on gas infrastructure, what Tim said about creativity is vital. And I think you are seeing that now in terms of the rapid take-up of facilities for providing liquefied natural gas, LNG, into the EU. That's part of our insurance policy, and it is not incompatible with the Green Deal because we know we need gas in our pipes, all the way through to 2049, and LNG is a great insurance policy. You see the Germans moving rapidly into floating storage and regasification units now. That will provide a, a, a great flexibility and insurance tool, if you will, for the future. But, but it's, it's right, we need to be creative about our infrastructure. And finally, optimism. What I hear from, from you, Andrew, and maybe a bit from the other panelists, a sort of hand-wringing, suddenly with, with one, with one uh, flick of the president's pen, era has put us at a disadvantage. Now, firstly, I think we should welcome that, you know, we've been moaning about the Americans not doing anything about climate change for years and how they're running behind. They've now stepped forward big time. They're putting their money where their mouth is. At some level, that is super welcome. But second is we should be confident. We talked about the single market. That is a fantastic asset. We have a far better functioning single market in many areas than the United States does. They are playing catch up in these areas, in relation to infrastructure, in relation to standards and the way we work in, in our electricity market, for example. So let's be confident about that. And, and finally, let's not get hung up on this, are we going into industrial policy? Ooh, what does this mean? I mean, I'll tell you what I think we need. 
And I think it's happening. If you look at what happened on the Battery Alliance under Vice President Sefcovic, and if you look at what is now starting to happen both on gas and in terms of industrial response, it's getting companies around the table, looking at the package that they need, whether it's in terms of financial support through innovative financing, looking at state aids in a holistic way and, and not in a monolithic way, and I'm, I'm sure that that's what the Vice President Veshte would say if she was here, mm -hmm. using the single market as, as an asset, and yeah, looking for creative ways with the industry deeply involved, with the public uh, sector, with the private, uh, with, the, with the member states, with the commission, to find uh, rapid solutions to ensure that the, the problem you've identified, meaning you know, we, we are still innovative, but we, we're, not, we're not realizing the fruits, the jobs, the growth within the European Union, uh, needn't be a problem. So I'm, I'm feeling in a confident mood on that. We've got to be confident, we've got to step forward. And this permitting thing is not an, a, a regulatory obsession, but it's part of that, it should be part of that discussion. It's part of the incentives, as Morten, Morten said, for investors to get involved, that we're not going to bog up the planning for renewables for years and years and years, and we're going to step forward and do it quickly. Let's get on with it. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Nice to finish on a note of optimism. L let me give each of the other panelists 30 seconds if it's okay, because we, we're just out of time. Uh, no, 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 it was, uh, it was fascinating to, to, to finish on a bright note. So, but 30 seconds, just fi fi final reflections or to pick up on any points uh, that you'd like to make. Thanks, Morten, thanks. Um, uh, I think we, we, uh, we have a lot of low hanging fruits out there in terms of making stuff work that we already adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, let's bear in mind, I mean, we do not have an internal market for energy as of now. Uh, very limited uh, capacity is in use cross-border. Uh, we could push this uh, much further that, that we've managed to do so far. And by doing so, uh, thereby uh, bringing uh, benefits to, to the Europeans at large in terms of hopefully lower energy prices and increased uh, security of supply. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that, that could be done and further enforced that we already adopted. Uh, so uh, politicians like to do new stuff and, and new laws and what have you, but let's also bear in mind that, that we could reinforce what we already uh, adopted uh, and by doing so also hopefully bringing uh, benefits in an extremely difficult time. Thanks. Thank you, Morten. And Roger, I don't know if you want to pick up with the, just on this question about credit insurance, if, if that's something you want to touch on, but please, the floor is yours. I think blending is, is an important instrument. It's allowed under um, the, the, the financial regulation, and we have talked a lot about it, bringing in grant money with uh, financial instruments, and, and some has been explored in the area of energy efficiency, by the way. But it's still a long way to go. But let me say um, uh, a few things on, on industrial policy. I think we have talked about um, the scale-up um, gap, about the fact that there's a risk of not reaping the benefits here of our investments and high risk take in relocation. But let me also say, if you look at the stock exchange at the top 100 companies in Europe, 95% probably uh, existed 50 years ago. And if you look at the US or China, you will see the opposite. They're all new. So we have to renew our industrial base. Now, this is not simply done. It requires a holistic approach, as you say. But I think it's important that we work on not only building up the supply chains, but the funding chain, that we work on the ecosystems, and this uh, needs to be done in a differentiated way for each member state, because there are strengths and, and weaknesses in each um, of them. And three, that we have a clear signal effect. We have moved away from funding for anything goes to a more thematic, policy-oriented approach. You have funding which is tied to specific areas, chips, AI, and so on. We need it definitely in the area of energy and probably to scale it up. And we need to make it attractive to institutional investors. Let's not forget that the institutional investors' assets under management are shrinking due to the downturn. And um, so they have overall less available. And secondly, they need to be convinced to invest in alternative assets. And the percentage here is decreasing. So it's important that we convey a political signal that this is the area where we want them to focus and we make it attractive. Thanks. Thanks, Roger. Tim? In the absence of a question, I'm going to just make a plug for forthcoming um, IEA work. Because on Thursday, uh, we have a thing called the Energy Technology Perspectives, which is one of our flagships uh, at the IEA. And the topic is precisely the one that we've spent some time on today on this question of clean energy manufacturing um, where is it today? Where would it need to be? What policies could help to determine what goes where? So um, I, I encourage people to take a look at that. 
Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And Gorn, finally. Yeah, I, <coughs> I'll try to be quick. I liked what uh, Roger said about uh, trying to make incentive systems so that uh, private uh, capital can see that uh, uh, this is a place to invest and this place is, of course, renewables. Uh, there are many instruments out there that you gentlemen have under your management. Too many. So it's very difficult for, for us who are practitioners out in the field to overview all of this. So it needs to be made more crystal clear, uh, I think, uh, how this helps and how this can help also our investors. Uh, investors are turning down uh, their headquarters, all that. They have a much shorter uh, attention span. Uh, than they used to have in the olden days. And when you compare then the European situation with the IRA, the IRA seems so much more tantalizing and attractive. It may not be that when you look into all the details, but that is kind of the challenge we have. And we have to do this quickly because uh, it takes time to build up uh, industrial value chains from nearly nothing uh, to being uh, globally relevant. And for instance, in, in uh, solar, Europe used to be the dominant uh, uh, value chain, the dominant region for solar, until we became a little bit complacent because the old uh, incentive systems were too good. So we let uh, the Chinese that are very good at learning and further developing and understood exactly how to build a large industry, large operations, and how to support that and how to work together in a very, very, very innovative way. They understood it, so they took that over. They're, they have not done anything bad. They have given us a lesson in industry building. And why can't we take that lesson and implement it here? Thank you very much, Gordon. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, Matthew, I'm afraid I think we're losing, losing the the battle of not uh, calling the Inflation Reduction Act the IRA. I, 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 read, I read in the newspapers there a few weeks ago that the British government wanted to talk to the United States about the IRA. I thought that, that, that brings back memories. Uh, for, but, <laughs> uh, but I would just like to thank everybody on the panel for, for um, their scene-setting contributions today for the rest of the day. I, I think it really ha you've picked and up all the topics that I think are going to be delved into in much greater uh, detail you know, at some of the, 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 the more technical panels over the course of the day, and indeed, obviously, at the working groups uh, for, the, uh, for the investors' dialogue over the course of the next few years. And I very much appreciate your, your time and expertise in that regard. And if we could just thank the panel in the usual way. Thank you. And now, now, if I understand correctly, we have a coffee break. So. <laughs>